from National Review headquarters in New York City. This is a Capital Writing author interview. Our guest today is Mark Moses. He is the author of the book, The Municipal Financial Crisis, a Framework for Understanding and Fixing Government Budgeting. Uh, thanks so much for being with us today, Mark. It's great to be here, Dominic. All right. So uh, you're joining us from out west uh, where you live, and uh, you've had a lot of experience out there uh, with various different kinds of municipal governments in different areas. You've also had some private sector experience as well. So could you just give us a little bit of background on uh, your, your experience that led you to write this book? Yeah, well, I, I came into government with a very different perspective than a lot of people who I interacted with in government. I, as you mentioned, I came from the private sector, uh, banking, real estate investments, small business consulting. So I had about a decade of that before I set foot in into a municipal agency. And I also had an interest in practical economics. I I, I read Henry Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson when I when I was in college, and so I I was really just amazed at the lack of basic economic understanding, basic lack of business understanding that that cities brought to the table when they made decisions, and even in managing their own finances, how. The, the political environment really blinded them to a lot of basics that a, a lot of the people knew when they were in other environments, like council members were successful at running businesses, but they, when it came down to it, they, they didn't really understand how their government organizations operated. And so I, I saw this, I saw the frustration, I was frustrated. And kind of in the spirit of if you see something, say something, I just thought it's really important to bring out an inside perspective of how these decisions are made, how the, what I characterize as systemic scope creep emerges uh, and, and is upheld over time. And, and that helps explain why the traditional remedies are not working the traditional remedies for financial struggles in cities municipalities are are not working and i wanted to put out a positive kind of vision of what that would look like what what a solution would look like i think so you, a lot of the critics of government first of all i think governments are local governments are very difficult to penetrate from the outside they're very difficult to understand and I worked with a lot of journalists to help them even ask good questions uh, and and get a good perspective. And so I understand the frustration out there, and I, I think you need a little bit of insight to craft solutions. So uh, which kinds of cities uh, have you worked for in the past and have you advised uh, on other things as well? Uh, my main experience is in California, but I've ventured out a little bit and and seen uh, a bit uh, across the country and i'm since i've written the book i've gotten more feedback and learned more across the country and although i think some of the particulars in california may seem a little extreme or may seem like an only in california kind of phenomenon the more i learn the more i see that unfortunately some of that is just a foreshadowing of and just kind of a leading indicator of the direction other cities are going. And really they, what they have in common is that they don't really define who they are and what they are. The, the, and, and I think that sets the stage for, again, what I characterize as systemic scope creep. And part of the thesis of my book is that it's impossible to successfully administer or budget for an amorphous organization. I mean, when you think about it, right, just from you don't start any organization without defining its mission and what it is uh, and how it's going to operate. And yet cities take on these nebulous missions, these open ended missions, which plants the seed for the systemic scope creep. And I give examples in the book of of some of the more explicit uh goals and missions of cities. I mean, to maximize local services is a is a common kind of goal, whether it's stated that explicitly, which in some cases it is, or whether it's just kind of left unsaid. And so the scope, the mission floats out there. 
And basically what that means is city councils, town councils, municipal board members are really deciding what the organization is and does from board meeting or council meeting to council meeting rather than operating off a firm base. So from the administrator's point of view, you you can't really administer an organization or manage an organization like that. It, it becomes more like juggling. And from a budgetary point of view, what you're doing is not financial planning. It's it's really just accounting for all these commitments that have been made to date and and hoping that you can last another year. So you talk in the book, <clears throat> excuse me, you, you phrase the uh, scope question as the difference between talking about how government does things versus what government should actually do. Or uh, you also talk about, uh, you know, uh, uh, explaining the purpose of why a local government exists in the first place. Why do we have local government? What is it for? And so uh, how would you answer that question? Yeah. And, and I think it's very, I don't know what the best word is, awkward that I spent 30 years in and around local government and nobody talked about this issue. No. And so the the floating mission or the floating nebulous scope was just an accepted reality of, oh, this is just the way we operate. We don't pretend to delimit what we do or focus on what we do. We just keep it all open-ended. And I think we've lost sight of, number one, what makes government different from a nonprofit or a commercial activity. And, you know, what is government? Government is the local authority empowered with the ability to legislate and enforce laws in a in a local jurisdiction. And that makes it good at some things, makes it good at defining property rights, protecting property rights at the local level, maybe crafting resolutions, uh, regulations related to noise in certain areas. But it doesn't make it good at central planning. It doesn't make it good at commercial activities. It doesn't make it good at what you might characterize as charitable activities. Those, and I think people really misunderstand the, the extent of, of what those powers really are good for and, and where they stop. And, and I, I, I kind of get it from the residents' point of view. They want to get their, quote, money's worth out of what they're paying in taxes. So often they'll bring problems to City Hall that, that City Hall is not necessarily good at fixing. But all that really does is it, it propagates the idea that that through this government legislative authority and enforcement authority, you can solve all problems, which is uh, a complete misconception of how to best solve these problems when you wind up really monopolizing the activity, you wind up crowding out more creative solutions, whether it's in a, a nonprofit organization's solution or a commercial venture solutions, in the name of uh, we're going to just legislate success or uh, into our into our locality. So uh, you mentioned how uh, city budgeting often is designed around just getting to next year, or it's designed around you know uh, meeting existing commitments and just kind of keeping that going and not really considering why they're there in the first place. One of the issues that you raise in the book in this area is the question of revenue, which you might think would be a really central concern in the budgeting process. If you have any kind of an organization, you want to know where money's coming from. Uh, you want to know how it's getting there. And you want it, and, and uh, if it's coming in below, you want to figure out why. If it's coming in above, you want to figure out why. Uh, but you make the argument in the book that a lot of these cities with revenue, um, revenues coming in for historical reasons that don't really have anything to do with, uh, with day-to-day -day, uh, operations. And a lot of times cities are just kind of winging it. Exactly. And and that's why running a, a government is not a business. Running government is not like running a business. You've got cities, uh, municipalities that seem to be resource rich because they they happen to have a major industry in town or a university in town that just helps help support them revenue wise. 
the fact that they're not insolvent doesn't mean they're well managed. It, it really is uh, sometimes an accident of geography. Uh, and then you've got some cities that are revenue starved because just of the formulaic way that revenues are, are, are often applied. So you, you can't look at it as the revenues or any real measure of a market or measure of really anything other than just a historical accident. And, and I think the, the municipal perspective on revenues, I mean, when, when a budget manager sits down to prepare a budget, the revenues are just taken as a given, like, okay, th these are our tax revenues, whether they're, they come in directly or through the state. And this is where we go on. And it, it creates the perspective that, that anything the organization does, if just marginally, if five people are satisfied in an activity, doesn't matter what it costs, that that's success. Because the, the perspective isn't that Oh wait a minute! We're extracting resources, economic resources, out of the local economy, whether from residents or, or from businesses, and so, the the perspective that anything we do that is positive to somebody is some is somehow successful, is is just part of what sustains the, the the mode of scarcity, the mode of always scrambling to prioritize uh, because there's only so much you can suck out of the local economy and, and starve off the local economy before you create other problems. And, and part of what I try to establish or communicate in the book is that avoiding insolvency itself is not a sign of financial success. When, when you have serial tax increases, when you have degradation of services when you have deferred maintenance as just techniques of balancing the budget then that is a financial failure that is an organizational failure and again the it goes back to the organizations do not define who they are what they are and and even begin to try to delimit what they do they'll talk about prioritizing and there there's a frenzy of prioritizing but but that just is a manifestation of the of the mode of operating from this concept of from from scarcity, which you're always going to come from scarcity if your objective is to maximize services because you'll never be doing enough in that mode. But that means you'll never be extracting enough from the local economy to feed all that. And just to cap off the point, this is why I think there's such alienation, but or the alienation grows between the residents and business owners and the cities because think about what happens if if the city goal is to maximize services and and to do that it has to extract from the local economy then the residents and business owners become the means to the ends of the government organization rather than wait a minute why was the government put in place the government was put in place as a means to the ends of the residents and business owners. So you get a complete flip in terms of who exists for whose sake. And I think that explains a lot of the alienation and a lot of the frustration. But uh, even when you have a small city and it's a representative form of government, it doesn't take long before the, the council members get in this mindset of, no, no, we're, try we're here to maximize services. And all of a sudden they start viewing uh, their their residents and business owners, their fellow residents and business owners as, as a means to their ends. You describe the budget process as a ritual and you say that, um, you know, this is something that cities do every year. Um, and, and, uh, it's almost treated as though completing the process is itself a success. Uh, even if, um, even if the actual result of it ends up being something that's not very, not very sensible. Um, and that it's uh, a lot of it's is focused on politics and not on like good financial sense. Um, you propose a couple of different alternative or you propose kind of an alternative way of doing budgeting. But first, let's talk about some other ways that have been proposed, which you also talked about in the book. One of them is zero based budgeting, which is something that gets thrown around at the federal level a lot. The idea of starting the budget every year at zero and uh, deliberately trying to justify each part of, of, of spending. Um, you 
uh, point to that as an example that sounds good in theory, but doesn't work very well in practice, right? That's right. It Well, it, it sounds good because it provides this image that you're really going through and scrubbing through everything, analyzing everything. And so where, and so to that extent, it, it sounds like a rigorous process. Uh, if you don't dig too deep into it or look at like, what the, what does that really mean for a government organization? But as a, as a local government, when you begin to implement something like that, you find, okay, the budget manager is charged with, who, by the way, doesn't have a whole lot of authority, right, in terms of deciding what really goes in. And, you know, they, they are really compiling things uh, more than having any real authority and, and recommending to maybe a city manager or town manager and then a council. And so when when that person sits down, by the time they sit down to prepare a budget for the upcoming year, look how much is already in place that where I characterize as they're just accounting for commitments that have already been made. Your your largest expenses are your your labor expenses, and those are already in place. It's already too late to change those uh, because those are typically multi-year contracts that not only define how much you compensate employees, but there's a lot in those agreements that affect the the way service is provided, the way, whether it's the, the schedules of the employees or the way work gets done, that's that's all codified into these agreements. So before you even, before your seat even gets warm from sitting down, you've got 80% of your, of your budget already spent. And then you've got contracts that are in place that, uh, where there are commitments that are made that by the, again, I'm talking about when you're six months out uh, from approving a budget, it's too late to change how work gets done and and how things get delivered if the seeds haven't been planted already. And so when you, and then you've got some perhaps politically sensitive issues where, you know, it's some money, but not a lot of money. And so no one really wants to go there. Sometimes this comes up with, you know, do we continue to subsidize the local golf course or something? And so but but see, this is where the it's not truly zero based because truly zero based says you you analyze everything with rigor, everything's on the table. But of course, golf courses aren't on the table because e- even if it's a small constituency that it satisfies, it, it's usually justified as well. It's not a whole lot of money. We'll just roll that over another year, and so and that's how these things sustain themselves over years. So by the time you get to the end, you're lucky if you still have anything left over on the margins to program in terms of something new or different. And and then more often these days, you find a squeeze where, oh, wait, we're, we're at 102% spent. And so now we've got to scramble and figure out how to adapt. But it's not really adapt in a way of questioning the scope of activity. It's how do we shave off on the margins so that we can, quote, balance the budget, which is really just a mathematical balancing. It says nothing about deferred maintenance and how much should have been spent on some things where there was responsibility taken uh, or or how sustainable it is. Yeah, let's talk about balanced budget, because that's another thing that you talk about in the book is something that sounds good in theory, but in practice doesn't always mean what it, what it seems like it means. In one sense... Uh, uh, cities have to have balanced budgets in the sense uh, that we talk about oftentimes with federal spending because, you know, the federal government can deficit spend in a way that cities can't. Um, so there's 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 that kind of difference constitutionally. But um, just because a budget is balanced on paper doesn't mean it's actually responsible and doesn't mean it's actually funding the obligations that need to get funded. And it doesn't mean... That's exactly right, because I always wonder, like, what's not in that budget that should be? Uh, mainly that category is uh, infrastructure maintenance or equipment replacement or vehicle replacement. But the cities, even though they can't print money like the at the federal level, they have their own way of deficit spending. And, and part of that is through deferred maintenance. Uh, the other part is what we've seen with the funding of 
personnel uh, retiree obligations where everything is not being funded in real time. Think costs are being really shifted out to the next generation of taxpayers and rate payers. And so there, there is a way through deferring maintenance, pushing activities out, uh, sometimes borrowing uh, can, in fact, borrowing is a good example in that sometimes cities will use their entire borrowing capacity to address one infrastructure issue uh, and leave no borrowing capacity for any other capital replacement items. So all of these techniques are can can be done in the context of, well, we approved a balanced budget uh, as an outcome, but underlying or kind of ticking time bombs related to deferred maintenance or obligations that are, will are, are not going to be paid until down the road. You talk about something else called performance budgeting, which is sort of a, a, a you describe it as kind of a, a newer trend in uh, in public finance. Uh, can you describe what that is and, and what are the shortcomings with that approach? Yeah, there's, there's a few different varieties of this. Uh, I think one of the more popular ones now is priority based budgeting and and again this a lot of these things sound good from a distance and 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 part of my motivation for writing the book is sometimes the devil is in the details and if you and if you really think things through a couple levels you see how they they really just sustain the status quo even though they're characterized as challenging the status quo just as zero based budget says we're going to challenge the status quo and have you justify all your expenses, priority-based budgeting says, we're going to go through and scrub this and make sure that everything is aligned with council priorities. And in that way, we we won't be wasting money on non-priorities and, and so forth. But here we have the problem again of council priorities are written in a way that's so broad all you've really done is changed the rules or the perspective on the budget game. And so now all you have to do to get something included in your budget is show that it has some tie to the, the council priorities. Well, council priorities, again, they're very broad. Sometimes they stretch into five, six, seven, eight categories of, of activities uh, in terms of well, the, the general health and welfare of the community, that which, you know, just that alone is so broad, you know, everything fits in there from recreation to code enforcement to everything. You're not really refining anything when, when you've got broad goals that are used as a standard by which you justify an expenditure. And so, and without exception, when these priority-based budgeting and I've been through this a number of times, and and I'm not saying you don't learn anything from this because the analysis can be helpful, and and you can come to a realization that you're you're funding something that no, that nobody really appreciates, and so it, it isn't that you get zero value from it. It's this. It's that you're not really challenging that premise of the open ended scope of the organization, and so if you're trying to prioritize in the context of an open ended scope. It's it, it's going to have very limited benefits. It's going to have benefits maybe on the margins, but then it's also a lot of work to go through this process. And so what you'll see happen, and I've watched this time and time again, a, a year or two after, sometimes priority-based budgeting never really gets implemented. It kind of it just it gets overwhelms the organization. Other times it'll get implemented once and then under pressure or just out of exhaustion, the organization will revert back to the traditional budgeting. So there's a reason the traditional budgeting sustains itself over time, because that's just kind of the go-to when you have no other place to go, because again, you're, you're, you're treading water trying to account for this nebulous organization that you've created. And so your alternative is what you call budgeting for scope. Uh, so what's that? Well, budgeting for scope means taking the perspective that activities drive costs that well first of all that that none of this is a mystery that it's a there's a cause and effect relationship here that 
activities drive costs and you you know a a dictum a dictate to just control spending misses the the real cause of spending and and so the the cause of spending is the the scope of activity that the organization takes on that 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 creates those activities that generate costs and so i'm i'm suggesting or recommending that cities really think about what they do not just as a a whole uh, broad category of oh look at all your activities but look at all your activities in the context of what is truly a governmental activity what what is really the kind of activity that is justified by the exercise of legislative authority and enforcement authority and and where have you crowded out commercial activities or nonprofit charitable activities that you're you're not even very good at because i mean my best example probably right now is when i think about recreation services you know those most of the cities i've seen their general fund will subsidize those to the tune of about 35 40% uh, and i think it's probably higher than that if you factor in all of the the costs and, and burden recreation with all the costs. And so from a distance, it sounds like, oh, they're subsidizing recreation. Well, that must be making it more accessible or less expensive to the residents. But but no, you're you're running recreation in a bureaucracy that's not really designed for those types of services. Again, it's a it's a legislative and enforcement body that's subject to the public records requests, it's subject to public meetings, all for good reason when you're conducting legislative and enforcement authority, but that hampers a recreation director who's trying to provide recreation services. I, I used to go head to head with a recreation director who couldn't understand all of our hiring rules. Well, but the hiring rules were all oriented towards a public agency and weren't really conducive to a lot of the issues that come up when you're running a recreation activity. And so the, so basically by burdening and, and she didn't understand why she had to go out to bid to, for uniforms, right. For the recreation activities. And so what, what it comes down to is the reason you have, the reason you need that 40% or more subsidy isn't to make this more accessible or available to the residents. It's to compensate for the fact that, you're providing recreation services through a bureaucratic organization that has all these rules to comply with that that nonprofits can do much better. Uh, and then when nonprofits do it, you you don't make the the size of your pool a political controversy because that's something a nonprofit can work out. But I've seen it where uh, in one city where they're they're paralyzed when it comes to renovating uh, and doing the required maintenance on their pool because they they can't decide how whether the pool should be olympic sized or some other sized and so those are the kind of issues that come up when when you go outside of what a legislative local legislative authority with enforcement powers uh can realistically do so let's talk about labor. You mentioned uh, in that example about hiring rules for for government. Uh, you also talked earlier about how uh, you know labor contracts limit what uh, people what 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 the government is able to do, both from a budgeting standpoint and from a just uh, the different rules uh, involved in, in in hiring and firing people. Um, a while ago, I did an interview with uh, Philip Howard from Common Good, who wrote a book called Not Accountable, where he argues about public sector unions. Um, and the and he argues in that book that um, uh, the way that public sector unions circumscribe the power of elected officials um, is actually unconstitutional because it's taking away uh, it's 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 delegating power that rightly belongs to government to these to these private organizations and removing it from the accountability of of elections and of and of you know open open public processes. Um, one of the things I took away from your book is you mentioned that finance people are not even involved in the 
labor contract negotiations of public sector unions. And so uh, there's 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 nobody there making the argument from a budgetary point of view about what the city can afford, uh, what, what it can afford to do and what it can't. That's right. And it's basically what it comes down to. A lot of it is that political hold where, you know, the it's the public sector unions for the most part that get those council members elected and keep them there. And if they, if they fight too hard against them, they'll run other candidates against them. So you don't stay in your seat long if you take on the, if the unions in, in, in too much of a confrontative manner. And so it winds up not being about any real concept of affordability. It winds up being, you've got to, success is a successful multi-year contract and and we'll figure out later how we're going to pay for it and 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 even even when management has been really determined to rein things in a bit uh unions will push back i've i've sat across the table from a union that said well you know i don't believe that you can't afford this you haven't gone out for a new sales tax and we'll walk the polls we'll we'll get on the phone, we'll, we'll pass the sales tax. Uh, and so, so, but you see what that kind of creates is the, you know, the public sector unions that are really strategically effective in, in getting these local taxes passed. It, it comes with a price, right? It comes with, they want a piece of that action for getting the sales tax passed. And it, it puts the management in a difficult position trying to take a stand on, no, we really can't afford this because they'll, they'll call the bluff and say, again, you haven't exhausted all the opportunities you have to raise revenues. Um, and by the way, it's not just the, there's a, there's a complete uh, kind of downward flow of that lack of accountability issue because it's not just, okay, the public sector unions really control the council. Because of that, they get their MOUs, their labor agreements adopted that, that restrict the internal management. For example, a, a, a fire chief cannot decide how to deploy firefighters at the various stations. That's all codified uh, in the... Uh, in the labor agreements. And so it, it's almost as if a, a fire chief has effect there that that person's effectively a figurehead because they, they really don't have management authority. The way you think of management authority is being able to decide how we staff, how many we staff, what time of day we staff, all that's codified in the labor agreements. Um, you talk about how these budget balancing techniques um, that are used, uh, you know, when you have these labor agreements that already take up a huge chunk of your budget um, and you have to do that because you already agreed to it. Um, what ends up happening is in order to uh, balance the budget, you don't maintain things that are supposed to be maintained. You put stuff off, you, you try to, you're always just shoving things off into the future. And then eventually the future arrives <laughs> and you actually have to pay for these things and now you can't do it. Um, what, uh, you know, the, 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 one of the remedies available to cities is bankruptcy, which is obviously not a desirable one, but it's, but it's there. Um, what are other remedies that, that cities have in order to figure out how to get this back once the bill does come due? Because a lot of this, as you've said, is from past decisions and you can't undo them. Yeah. And, and bankruptcy, municipal bankruptcy has very limited positive effects long term, right? You, yeah, you can shed some debt. Maybe you can rewrite uh, some contracts, but the, the problem is the fundamental problem is it doesn't change the culture of the organization. It doesn't change the mission of the organization. And so you're, and, and if you're a lot of these cities that have filed bankruptcy or charter cities, it doesn't change the city charter. And so what you're left with is the, the same drivers that got you into that kind of situation in the first place. And so 
the so that and and bankrupt, municipal bankruptcy costs a lot of money. The, it paralyzes the organization. No one can really make any decisions during the the bankruptcy time. So it's a it's a huge loss for the the local residents and and business owners. And so the uh, and so the the other types of things that are done, I think, have a similar kind of problem where the you're talking about more efficiency, refining this, adding technology. And and where I see all of these as really missing the point is none of them really addresses the the proper scope of the organization. None of them, it deals with improving how the work gets done without first looking at, should the organization even be doing this? And the the cycle is really an awkward one where as we kind of, as we talked about the, by the time you sit down to prepare the budget, most of the decisions have really already been made. You're not really doing financial planning, but then you get to the end, you declare, you've got a balanced budget. No one really liked the process to begin with. They're all exhausted. It's if you're, if your year is July 1st, it's summertime, you're thinking about the summer. And so then think about what happens you lose that opportunity to begin to plant the seeds for any real change in the upcoming year. And so that, so that cycle winds up being a, a, really a spiral down because things get worse and worse each year. And that's why one of the things I argue in the book is that cities enter each economic downturn less, uh, in, in worse shape than the, than they entered the previous downturn. And that's because whenever times are quote good or revenues are up from the perspective of the city, they increase their scope of activity and the, the federal relief package, the 2021 ARPA federal relief really expanded the scope of activity and covered up for the cities taking on more than they can handle ask them to really do more because now they, they weren't allowed to use the money to pay down debt. And so what do they do? They, they spread the money around to businesses. They, they created new activities, all increasing their scope. So the, the point is the, you can, inc you can improve things on the margins when you assume the status quo. Yes, you can improve visibility. You can improve, the communication, you can improve uh, efficiencies and yeah, you can contract out some things that are internal, but, but then the organization is still having to manage those activities. And, and my point is you have to start with challenging your, your status quo, what you've taken on as a scope of the organization's uh, mission. So you talk about this as a crisis. It's right there in the title, municipal financial crisis. Um, crisis is a word that gets used a lot, might get overused. Uh, it gets, it gets uh, you know, it's a, a description people put on lots of different things. A cynic might look at this and say, well, governments have been spending money irresponsibly for a really long time. Um, they've been able to keep doing it. Uh, why is it a crisis now? Yeah, and I, I challenge that perspective that we should be, when I say we, I mean taxpayers, business owners, people that d depend on cities and uh, for what they do or should be doing, that that they really are getting shortchanged. That that the that we don't really need to be coming from scarcity. That we don't need to have cities across the country in in constant turmoil. That this is really something that is avoidable. It. It stems from having the really the wrong goals. It's I I don't think it's the people. I don't think it's the systems, and I don't think it's the incentives. Although those can play in, but I think fundamentally we've set our municipalities up for failure by allowing them to take on unlimited scope. And I, I know that the conventional model is. Well, yeah, that's just the way it is, as you described. We just, the pendulum kind of swings between, you know, taxes creep up. We, we feel like we're overtaxed. 
uh, the taxes go down, but then we feel like we're underserviced. Uh, so then the taxes go up and that like we're caught between this pendulum that swings back and forth between unacceptable taxing levels and unacceptable servicing levels. And, and in a way, yeah, you are stuck there when your local governments are organizations whose goals and, uh, and reasons for being are something you just make up as you go along. Then, then we are trapped in that. My message is this is a crisis because that's not just measured in terms of, of municipal bankruptcy or insolvency, but it's measured in the degradation of services. The fact that we have serial tax increases uh, as a pattern uh, throughout, even in the, recovery decade that preceded the pandemic. Uh, taxes continued to increase, even though by all other accounts, it was a positive economy in terms of a growing economy. And so the it's a matter of what are we happy with? Are we happy with cra getting mediocre services, crowding out more innovative solution providers? Or are we resigned to this kind of scarcity dynamic. And I, I say that's, that's not the model we should buy into. Well, a lot of people think about cities with financial problems. We think of New York City, we think of Detroit, we think of Chicago, um, these places that have had these very sort of high profile failures of, uh, of financial um, stability. Um, but obviously there's lots of cities in the United States with a hundred thousand people in them, or with fifty thousand people in them, um, that that are not you know giant uh, world cities, but are but are, are 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 much much smaller. How much does your advice change based on the size of a city, um, and and uh, do these problems that you're talking about apply just as much to big cities where we've seen it uh, cause problems? Uh, as it does to smaller cities that might not get as much notice just because fewer people live there. Yeah, the more I learn about uh, cities across the country, because when I wrote the book, I, I wasn't really thinking about rural cities and uh, and some of the cities I didn't have a lot of experience with. But the more I learn, the more I learn that this, this is a, a scalable kind of solution and issue in terms of no matter what size organization you are, whether you're small city, medium city, large city, you're, if you don't define, again, we're back to who you are, what you are, why you are, and use that as a base for making decisions. I mean, you can have debates about where to draw lines on where the government should start and stop, but those are the debates we should be having. But those are the discussions that we blow right over because Again, it's this acceptance that it's okay that this organization is nebulous and amorphous and it, and we can manage that way. And I think the, and in the case of government now, the more it takes on, the more it politicizes things. And, and large cities have a huge disadvantage because all of their spending is politicized. If you, you know, can imagine a, a quote, a better run city or more disciplined city is probably one you've never heard about because their, their decisions are not being politicized as much as the larger cities. They're able to execute things that you would consider more financially uh, justified and reasonable and uh, responsible. And so, and, and they're able to implement these policies kind of quietly and and define themselves in a way and 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 this is done to some extent in some places uh it's just not done enough i mean in 30 years i only heard a couple times where an elected official pushed back and said is this thing you're proposing really in our proper scope of activity should we really be doing this so so those questions get asked but my point is not often enough and not early enough in, in the process. And so, yeah, I think this is the, the principles here apply to cities of any size and really uh, 
even when you go up the range a little bit into state government, because you've got issues with states about what they should be taking on and what they shouldn't in terms of their scope. So you're a person that cities hire um, to come in and, and, uh, and, and oversee the financial uh, situation and, and give advice and, uh, and figure out how all that should go. Um, you know, you come in from the outside, you've worked for multiple different cities. So you have this, you know, breadth of experience. You've seen what works other places, what doesn't work in other places and, and how that might apply in a new situation. Um, on the other hand, you've got elected officials in, in government who come from that community, who are, have the sort of democratic legitimacy of being voted for. Um, and they're, you know, the representatives of the people who live there. Um, when there's a disagreement between uh, what you might be saying is financially reasonable and what an elected official is saying uh, they want to do, uh, why, should, why, should, why should we take your advice uh, because nobody voted for you, right? Uh, that, you know, that there's kind of that, 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 that attitude and that's not a totally ridiculous thing to say, right? Because nobody did vote for you, that's true. Um, why, uh, d have you run into that exact situation ever? And, and if so, how do, you, how do you reply to that? Yeah, I'm, I shy away from those kind of situations because I don't think there's really a way to, to win in those, in those situations, because what you described there is one where the, and this is kind of, this is very classic where city officials, you know, want their city attorney to tell them how, how they're able to legally do what they want to do. And they want consultants to tell them, you know, how to do what they want to do, not really solve these kind of longer term problems that uh, are festering. And so unfortunately, until a city is, is really in an existential crisis that is recognized, not just kind of glossed over, but recognized, they're, they're not really up to hearing these types of things. I mean, part of what I'm trying to do in my work is help empower those who on the outside, they're, they're frustrated. They, they think there's something wrong, but they don't really know how to express it. And sometimes these people end up on council, but what will happen is they'll get marginalized because they'll vote no, but they won't really articulate why they're voting no. They'll get backed into a corner and positioned as being obstinate, getting in the way of progress. And it's like, well, you keep voting no. Like, you know, what's your positive vision? And they don't have a good answer. And so I, I think that group has been marginalized because, and because I think they're right in terms of their conclusion that there's something wrong because there, there really is something wrong. And I'm trying to provide some words for that and, uh, and concrete direct experience of that in my book. And, and also get past the, it's, it's easy to criticize and there's a lot of people doing good criticism of, of what's going on, but what we need is, are, are positive solutions and positive visions of, look, you're, this doesn't have to be this ongoing scarcity. Look, we, we don't have to keep crowding out better innovative solutions in the commercial sector and nonprofit sector. And so that's really the message I'm trying to get out there and the people I'm trying to empower and where that might connect with a council. I'm, I'm open to, to working with them and dealing with them. But as if the premise is they're still locked into their goals of maximizing local services, then they're, I can't really offer a solution because they're, they're, they're embracing the systemic problem that, that gave rise to all these things that they don't like the effect, but that is the effect of, of trying to run an organization the way uh, most cities run. Yeah, one thing conservatives like uh, some conservatives will talk about is um, the uh, the idea of you know pushing power down to the local level, um, taking things away from the federal government and putting them more on state and local governments because those are closer to uh, the people that they're serving and might have some better knowledge of how best to manage some of these programs and things like that. Uh, in your experience, well, what do you think about just the you know putting aside the theoretical question of whether that's desirable? 
do cities have the capacity and the ability to actually take on additional tasks that are currently being handled by other sides, other parts of government? Well, be, because of the systemic scope creep, they, they can't even responsibly handle the things they've already taken on. When I mean, just look at the, I mean, a lot of cities, they, they can't even give you a good inventory of their infrastructure or the property they own. And if you can't even come up with a good inventory, how can you be responsibly managing that that property? And so I, I see it as an issue uh, not of size, but of scope, that that we're we're not looking at kind of right sizing per se and that, oh, things are too big. Uh, and the same way I don't go after spending, like spending is too big. Although, yeah, I think those are problems. But I think you, the way you get to those problems is by having discussions at the level of scope and, and purpose of the organization, because that's the only way you really get underneath these issues in, in terms of defining the organization in a way that can delimit the activity in a way where you're not in ongoing crisis mode. So yeah, I, I, I really believe it's, it's an issue of scope, not size, and that the discussion, if you're going to have debate, debate about proper scope, because the the size thing is a winds up getting away from you very easily. Because because what's your standard of deciding too big or too small if it's not in reference to scope? All right. Well, thanks so much, Mark. Uh, the book is called Municipal Financial Crisis. Um, it's, uh, it's a, it's not very long book at all. It's something you can read in, in not very much time, but it provides, uh, some really good, uh, explanation from somebody who's had a lot of experience in this field, sort of describing how these processes actually work and how they can be improved. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and, and Mark provides some really good sort of big picture, uh, examples, but also, uh, zooming into really specific things that cities can do better. So, uh, thanks so much for talking with us, Mark. Yeah, thank you very much. Great being here.